So uh, first, I'm absolutely uh, delighted to be here. And I love being in this conference room because this conference room has so many amazing memories to me from uh, Dr. Willerson and 12 years working together in the NIH uh, Cell Therapy Network, which was uh, fantastic. And also I have two sons that were in Houston. So one was trained at MD Anderson and the other is a retinal specialist in town. So I have a soft spot in my heart for Houston. What I'd like to do today is talk about refractory angina and spread this a little bit. So, um, and in terms of disclosures, I don't own anything, but I am on steering committees and national PI for several of the trials. And so involved in the development of it. So there's an increasing number of people that have um, uh, significant coronary disease and significant angina especially as we've um, decreased mortality in coronary disease and as the population gets older. There's 12 to 15 million patients in the United States that have chronic angina. And that's about 10 to 15% of people in cardiac cath labs have disease that's not amenable to revascularization. You know the thing, chronic total acute degenerate vein grafts, uh, comorbidities, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. But two things to keep back up. If you look in the COURAGE trial, at one year, 42% of the medical therapy arm and 34% of the PCR arm had significant angina, more than class two. If you look at the ischemia trial, the number that were free at three months um, and one year, at one year, only 60% of the PCI arm, so 40% had angina and only 25% of the medical therapy arms. So the standard uh, treatments of revascularization and medical therapy are suboptimal as well. One of the problems in this field is the, uh, tech, the terminology is confusing. No option patients, refractory angina, refractory ischemia, advanced coronary disease. And there's been almost no natural history disease. And there is no large national database or registry, and you couldn't really keep track of these patients until just very recently. And then the question is their high morbidity mortality. Another issue is when you look at chest pain, it's complicated, right? And you have symptoms, and you have coronary anatomy, and you have myocardial perfusion, and they don't always go together, and they're not always consistent. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So why do people have chest pain? And I think this is a really important thing to talk about. And I've tried now, and I think we've successfully broadened the definition of refractory angina. So you have epicardial coronary disease, you have pre-arterioles and arterioles, and then you have the microvasculature. And then involved in that, you have atherosclerosis, you have vasoconstriction, either failure to dilate, or actively spasm, right? And this is a very complex thing. And people put them in boxes, but they're not boxes. These overlap in patient populations, and I'm trying to make that case today, and we have to address that. And then the next part, this comes from a review that we just had in Jack Interventional, is the neurologic or how you perceive chest pain. And that's very complicated as well. So I think chest pain is super is super common and super complicated. And so we'll make that case. So what we've done, and I did in Minneapolis and in Los Angeles and now at uh, Christ Hospital, is we have a program, it's called Comprehensive Angina Relief Program. So why call it the CARE program? Well. Would you rather send your mother three hours away to go to the no option program? So we we sort of feel like that's probably not the best choice, like kind of like heart failure, right? Um, so our goal of having this is to have, improve the quality of care for this unique and growing subset of patients, to find the long-term uh, outcome, natural history and predictors, and then provide unique treatment options, both those available and uh, treatments. And I'll tell you, so I've just been in Cincinnati for four years. Our CTO program now does more than 300 CTOs a year. Our woman's heart program has a three month waiting list to get in. And on Tuesday, I saw 25 patients and 16 of them had refractory angina. 
coming from all over the thing. There is a ton of these people out there. And from a business standpoint and a care standpoint, it's a huge on that need. So let's start a few of these things. Are these people really out there? Are they high risk? Can you stratify? Are they always no options? All important issues that by having a registry, we've been able to answer these questions. So first, go, let's go back to 1998. This is when stem cell gene therapy stuff first started. And they did a consecutive series at Cleveland Clinic. And they found 12% of the patients were symptomatic, clear-cut ischemia, and not candidates for revascularization. And of course, previous cabbage number of vessels correlated. They figured it was 100 to 200,000 patients a year. Then they published this data of the 59 patients. They showed that there was a mortality rate of 17%, a hospitalization rate of 128%, a MI rate of 25%. And they reported that these are really, you know, these patients are doing poorly. Was that true? Well, we we repeated this at the Minneapolis Heart Institute. So first of all, this was consecutive, 500 consecutive patients in the cath lab, and we use a lot of CTA. So the number of normal coronaries was limited. Um, the number with complete revascularization or in it was 37%, but 29% of people either were not candidates for revascularization or had incomplete revascularization. And we looked at the mortality of that and the group that was incomplete or partial had a 15% mortality at three years. So certainly not 17% per year, but worse than the other group for sure. And then we had to put a registry together at the time we called it the Optus Regiment. And this was a paper we published in European Heart Journal, 1200 patients, who are they? They used to smoke, but mo- almost nobody does anymore. 36% diabetes, 30% heart failure, 75% previous MI, 70 plus percent previous cabbage, and 70 plus percent previous PCI. So these are heavily revascularized people. And when we looked at the mortality, this is the curve. And I'm very confident in this curve because we re- I predicted two years in a row within one person number of people that were gonna die. And it turns out it's only about 3% per year, which is not very much different than age match controls. So this is not a dying problem as much as it is a quality of life problem. And I think that's an important part when you see these people, they live a long time because we do have good medical therapy. So now who are these people when you see them? So these are four phenotypes that we put published and phenotype A is microvascular angina. So these are people with non-obstructive disease and we're gonna spend some time today talking about that because I think it's a really important thing I'm doing now five or six coronary reactivity tests per week on people with non-obstructive disease, either Minoca, Inoca, Anoca, and we'll talk about that. Second, are the phenotype B is kind of your classic CTO patients. And I work very closely with our CTO. I do anti-grade CTOs, but our, we have advanced CTO operator who does, um, again, like 300 a year. Phenotype C is the type 1, type 2 diabetic with diffuse distal and side branch disease. And then phenotype 4 is, I've had two bypasses, I've had 27 PCI guy, right? And you, we know these patients and they're all out there and there's differences in terms of how they do. So if you're a no option patient, are you always a no option patient? It's an important concept because when you see people in clinic, I always have everything available, including I look at the old angiogram. So it turns out about 25% of people get a subsequent revascularization within the next two years. And in those, 69% or 70% are either new lesions, progression of disease, in particular old vein grafts, and 20% resinosis. And then there's the 30% of people that you said they were no option two years ago, and now you get pushed into doing something, third bypass, really complex PCI, and that doesn't always turn out so well. So that's the highest risk group of people. So what do we do when you come to clinic? So number one, we make sure you're on optimal treatment management. We look at risk factor modification. LDLs are under 70 in everybody. We look at revascularization options, including complex. And then we have a series of treatment options, and we're gonna go through those and kind of give you a spectrum of what's available, including new. So one that people have forgotten about is EECP. 
So we use a lot of EECP. This is the most common approved option. So only two approved options for EECP and e or for refractory energy in the United States. And one is EECP. That's what it used to look like, been around for 30 years. And basically the physiology is just like a balloon pump. So you have cuffs on your leg and you increase flow di during diastole, and then you decrease flow and you decrease afterload in systole. And it's time to the thing, and you do this uh, an hour a day for seven weeks, uh, or twice a day for three and a half weeks. And the data is based on a sham controlled trial, musty ECP, that showed an improvement in time to ST depression. This was only six weeks post uh, treatment not total exercise duration, and then significant improvement in angina. So now it's time to uh, uh, EECP works in chronic coronary disease in 75 to 80% of people have improvement. And if you look at microvascular angina, which we just published, 75 to 80% improvement in microvascular angina as well. If you have microvascular dysfunction. And there's a, we'll talk more about that. So this is what it's approved for. Everyone's covered. It does really well. And actually there's a big, there's a company called Flow Therapy that's very active in Texas. And uh, in particular, it's probably one of the best treatments for long COVID, which long COVID patients have microvascular dysfunction. So it's a very interesting thing. The second approved is TMR. And so TMR is approved actually standalone and as an adjunct. The problem, of course, the mechanism was thought to be uh, either you cause injury and causes angiogenesis or you get on um, denervation. The problem is there's increased morbidity and mortality with it. And then the direct trial, which was done some endocardial showed no difference and in actually higher, worse outcomes. So this is kind of very seldom used. Only a few sites in the country use it as adjunct. But this is the data and you can see about half the trials had higher mortality and certainly higher than what I just told you is in the natural history. So I think this is historical. Another one and in Europe was the treatment of choice in a European society about 15, 20 years ago is neurostimulation. It's approved for back pain, it's not approved for angina. We did a series of trials it actually um, decreases sympathetic tone and blocks pain perception. It decreases oxygen on demand and actually improves microcircuitory support. You actually put it in and you do it to the derm, you stimulate and get where the engine is. And we actually showed a trial that if you turn it on, the engine goes away. If you turn it off, the engine comes back. Problem, of course, we did sham control. It's very hard to do it. These people live a long time. It's like pacemakers you have to keep changing it. So it ends up being expensive and, they, and the, it wears off over time. So this is seldom used. I maybe did one last year. So what about pharmacology? There's a lot of pharmacology out there and renolazine, uh, L-arginine, and there's a new agent that we're working with called from a company called Imbria that's like trimetazine and it changes the way the heart metabolizes uh, energy. And I'm really uh, encouraged about this. It got delayed by all the COVID, but we should start those trials this year. This is L-arginine. Lots of good data that show you increase nitric oxide, you increase coronary blood flow, you improve erectile function. Always, patients always love that. But here's the problem. You have to use eight grams. And it's not very easy to do. So again, works in a few patients. What about renolazine? So renolazine um, was felt to be a metabolic changer, but in terms, what it really do is it changes the um, uh, uh, the way it uh, changes the late inward sodium currents. And so it has a lot of different effects. This is the ERICA trial which actually showed a uh, significant improvement in angina compared to amlodipine, but only by 1.7 episodes of angina a week. And if you looked at it, it was concentrated in those people who had a lot of angina, right? If you don't have angina to start with, you can't really improve it. But that is approved, and we've actually did it in 100 consecutive refractory angina patients and showed that about 60% of people get better. So about 60% of people are on this long-term and it's effective. So it's a very good drug for that. What about cell therapy and regenerative? And so there's been a lot, and certainly this audience knows about cell therapy, one of the biggest places where you've done it. Can you grow new blood vessels? 
Well, turns out in preclinical models, multiple models, gene therapy, protein therapy, cell therapy, clearly you can do that. Very effective. But what about patients? And so first important point, another with refractory angina, you have to be aware of the placebo effect. This is the placebo group in placebo controlled trials. And if you look at that, you have about a 40 to 60 second improvement in exercise time in the placebo group. So you have to be aware of it when you do these trials. And this is the issue. Angina fluctuates, probably because of vasoconstriction. There's a regression to the mean. You have the Hawthorne effect. You have the true placebo effect. And on top of that, you have to show a therapeutic effect. So that's why trials in this area have been difficult to do. And I'm going to tell you about one that was just presented at ACC, where I think the group in, in London is doing a terrific job in terms of design. So what about gene therapy? And I'm, this is historical, but this is, quote, trials that didn't work. This is the agent trial. And this is FGF4. And the co-primary endpoint was negative in terms of exercise time. But look at that variability. And that's the problem with the exercise time. But if you looked at angina in this large double-blind placebo-controlled trial, there was a significant improvement in angina both six months and 12 months. So I put this because the genes have gotten better and the vectors have gotten better. And this is going to change. And you're going to see a lot of gene therapy in the next five to 10 years. Trust me. Did you get gene or cell therapy? What about cell therapy? So this is the data. CD34 cells compared to bone marrow mononuclear cells have better you know, improvement in capillary density perfusion. Multiple trials have shown this in small animal models. And this is a pig model, uh, a uh, amyloid constrictor model that showed injecting intramyocardial into the ischemic zone. And uh, this is CD31 in pigs, which is the equivalent of CD34. It showed significant improvement reduction in your ischemic zone. So this led us to go to catheter-based cell, and Emerson and I are talking this morning. Between Emerson and I, we probably have the most experience in the world in terms of doing intramyocardial injections. It can be done safely, and we're working on doing that better for this new generation of agents. So this was the ACT34 trial. Um, and on the left, this is the patient population. Class three or class four angina, optimal medical therapy, not candidates for revascularization and documented ischemia. And when we did that, we did it with a low dose, a high dose and placebo. Everyone got GCSF, everyone got intramyocardial injection. And what we saw is a significant reduction in angina, six episodes a week, which is a lot, both the mid and high dose, but there was a plateau effect and a significant improvement in exercise time. Now people could argue that the placebo group got GCSF and there might have been some, uh, it might not be a true placebo, but even then a point is on top of that, a significant improvement in exercise and improvement in a uh, decrease in events. Um, we'll, I'll come back in a second. So then we went to a phase three trial and we're recruiting well. And in the middle of the phase three trial, a company made a business decision and the trial stopped. And if that had not happened, we would have CD34 cell therapy available for us. And here's what, in we looked at the partial trial, same thing, proven in exercise time, reduction in angina, events, reduction in events. And so I say, oh Lord, here comes circumstances beyond our control. It was stopped not for efficacy or safety, but purely a business decision. And I think many of us in the field look at this and say opportunity lost. So we put the three double-blind placebo-controlled trials together, published in the European Heart Journal. Again, strong improvement in exercise, strong reduction in angina, and a significant improvement in mortality. So there are countries in the world that have cell therapy available, but there's a lot of negativity about it. The prop main negativity is the business plan. It's been expensive to do. So what trials in refractory angina have improved exercise time? Nothing until the cell therapy. And so this is a challenging because what endpoint do we use? And the FDA has wanted us to use exercise time, but there's a lot of variability in it. And so I'm gonna talk, come back to that in a minute. So this is what I say about cell therapy. 
They cured me using this new miracle drug. I'm afraid it's going to be years before it's approved. And that's where we're at. So we're kind of back to finish with that. But just so you should know, if you look at the meta-analysis, significant proof that looked at refractory angina patients with cell therapy, improvement in mortality, improvement in angina, angina frequency, quality of life, exercise time, and EF. It's really consistent data. So now, just so you know, regenerative therapy is not gone. This is actually the Xylocor trial that was just published both the phase one in CERC interventions and the phase two is getting ready to get started. That showed improvement in PET, improvement in angina, and improvement in exercise time that correlated. So the next trial will be a larger randomized double blind using um, percutaneous injection. Um, and this is actually also Todd Rosengart has been a key part of this. This is really so, again, strong Texas heart influence on this trial. But this is the results that you can see if you look at the composite endpoint, which I think that they're going to approve going forward. You can see there's a consistent effect across perfusion, exercise, and angina. So I'm very encouraged about that. There's also one cell therapy trial going and a new generation of cell therapy trials that are gonna start in the next couple of years. All right, what about stem cell clinics? So just worth noting, tell your patients not to spend $20,000 and get IV stem cells. That doesn't work for refractory engine. You need to have proper delivery and it depends on the agent, but most of it's been intramyocardial delivery, which you don't get in a stem cell clinic. All right. Now let's move to interventional options because it's important when you take care of refractory angina to have a very close relationship with your interventional group. Now I'm a little biased because I'm an interventional cardiologist, but CTOPCI has dramatically changed this. And I will tell you with every patient, we look to see if you can revascularize with the newest techniques and we can revascularize more people all the time. And so this is CTO, I'm not gonna, that's not a CTO talk, but here's the point, a significant percentage of people do it. But in the best of hands, about 10% of people, the even Bill Lombardi, who just came to our place and looked at it, about 10% of patients they say it's not worth it. About 10 or 15% of people come back and we don't do it. So the largest enrollers in the coronary sinus reducer trial are CTO operators. And about 30% of CTO patients still have angina. So this is, you know, these are complementary techniques. And I think one of the key things about refractory angina is this is a team-based sport. You need to work together with a whole group of people. And I'll show you. So now we're going to shift into the microvasculature because this is super important. The most of the vasculature, and this is true in the whole body. If you look at most of the unmet needs that we have in cardiology, it's microvasculature. 75% of HEFPEF patients have, micro, have abnormal coronary flow reserve. The worst STEMI patients are the patients with microvascular obstruction. 30% of post-PCI and post-CTO patients still have chest pain. And you have INOCA, ANOCA, and MINOCA, and we're going to talk about. But this is actually the coronary science reducer. This is the Beck procedure, which closed off your coronary science. And if bypass would have never come along, maybe we'd still be doing it because there was some improvement early on. But of course, doing bypass surgery was significantly better. But the coronary sinus reducer is a um, barbell-shaped stint that you put in the coronary sinus with the same principle. And that there's high velocity across the middle part of that, but you develop restenosis. And over time, you create an outflow gradient. And there's a lot of discussion about mechanism, but theoretically, the way it does it, it changes the endocardial to epicardial ratio. It restores it to normal compared to what ischemics are. So that's one mechanism, but I'll also tell you now, four different groups have shown a significant improvement in coronary flow reserve. But I think most of the mechanism improvement is the microvasculature, which is why I tied together. This is what it looks like. Turns out over time, the stint stays open. If you ever, if the EP people out there ever want to use that coronary science, all you would have to do is go and put a balloon, blow it up, you can get rid of it. 
So it's not, it's very safe. More than 5,000 have been put in across the world and excellent safety. So this is the first trial which showed a significant reduction in angina on blinded. That went to the Kasira trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which uh, 50 people and 50 people in a sham. It showed a significant improvement in angina, strong 10 for exercise, although they did bicycle exercise and improvement towards events. So this got it approved in Europe, but not yet in the United States. And again, this shows you uh, that the device stays open with CT long-term with a, with a stenosis in the middle. So just at the ACC last week, one of the late-breaking trials was done from the Orbita group, and they showed a significant improvement in angina, very consistent with what they did before. They also did MRI perfusion, and it's kind of a small trial for that, but what they showed is no improvement in transmural perfusion, but a significant improvement in endocardial perfusion, which is consistent with the mechanism. And they showed reduced angina and improved quality of life. So this is now the second blinded trial that actually significantly shows it. This is a large European registry. It shows a significant improvement in angina. About 75% of people have improvement in angina. So that brings it to the Cusira 2 trial. I'm the national PI with Greg Stone. And you guys are up and running and ready to go. And so we'll be invent, uh, hopefully, um, um, participating in the trial. The design is 190 patients with the reducer and 190 sham. There's also registries for microvascular angina for patients who can't walk on a treadmill, those with amputation, and patients who have uh, right-sided ischemia. So this is a great trial. Interventionalists can do it. You, I think you'll really look forward to doing it, and I hope it's this. The big discussion next week with the FDA is, Currently, the primary endpoint is exercise time. And should it be angina based on the, on the trial? So that's a lot of discussion. There's also shockwave therapy out, not available in the United States, but actually you do external beam shockwave. And there's some evidence that that works. Um, so there's a lot of really interesting things. The question is, how do you get them in our hands because of trial design? It's really a trial design issue. So for the record, these are people, bypass didn't work, angioplasty didn't work, medical therapy didn't work, tender loving care didn't work. So these are, this is a challenging population. So when we see, and you come to my clinic, we have uh, G, the triple gene for VEGF, the new metabolic inhibitor. We have uh, stem cells either soon to be or, or coming, and then the coronary sinus reducer in addition to the regular therapies that we do. So now I'm gonna shift in the last uh, five minutes or so, and we'll have plenty of time for questions, is the microvasculature. So this is a huge unmet need. So this is INOCA and ANOCA. So if you look at a cath lab, 30 to 40% of patients have angina, have non-obstructive coronary artery disease. And it's way underappreciated and way underlooked for. And so for me, I would strongly encourage to be here, first of all, to have a comprehensive angina clinic, and number two, to be involved in microvasculature testing. So if you look at it, um, it, it it's uh, again, 40 to 50, 50% have chest pain. Patients with abnormal coronary flow reserve have a significant increase in MACE. And a lot of that's heart failure because these patients develop HFPF. Now, if you look at invasive testing, this is the Cormica trial that randomized patients to invasive, invasive testing or um, empiric treatments. And at the end of one year, there was a significant improvement. Oh, this is a shock. Knowing what your problem is helps you treat that. I mean, that's what we do, we're living, right? You make a diagnosis. And this has been an area of nihilism. The actual average person with ANOCA, 70 or 80% are women, has had chest pain for six to eight years, has seen three different cardiologists, has had four angiograms or CT angiograms, and has had more than five stress tests. And you know what they don't have? A diagnosis. We need, we need to uh, stop 
ignoring these people. So what we do is we do investive testing with acetylcholine, you need to do both. You need to use adenosine to look at coronary flow reserve, and you need to do acetylcholine to look at endothel mid dose, looks at endothelial dependent microvascular dysfunction, and the high dose looks for epicardial coronary spasm. And I will tell you that these people don't fit in boxes. There's a combination of it. So I did four yesterday before I came on the plane in the afternoon, and it's it's shocking the stuff you see. And it, in, in addition, it goes in with patients who have myocardial bridges and a combination of spasm, atherosclerosis, myocardial bridges. It's fascinating work. There's evidence for microvascular dysfunction that bone marrow uh, treatment works. And we did a CD34 cell in young, and these are again, the microvascular angina. We showed a significant improvement in coronary flow reserve from 2.08 to 2.68. Well, I should go back. There's multiple ways to look at coronary flow reserve and microvascular function. One is with a Doppler flow catheter, which is what I spent my most of my life doing. The Doppler is currently being redesigned and not available. So in the United States, the most common one is to do thermal dilution. There's pros and cons of uh, Doppler versus thermal dilution. And then there's also continuous. But clearly, knowing what your coronary flow reserve is super predictive in terms of your outcome and your symptoms. So this is data with the coronary science. So cell therapy works for that. It, this is data with the coronary science reducer, shows it improves microvascular function. Four different groups have shown this, a reduction in IMR, an improvement in coronary flow reserve, an improvement in six minute walk, and a reduction in angina. And then if you look, so our current trials for microvascular engine include the phase CD34, which just ended, the Imbria, the Warrior trial, which is going to look at strategies of how you do it, and then the coronary sinus reducer. But here's what I'd say. In our clinic, even doing the standard therapies that we use, including EECP for the right patients, and optimizing antispasm testing for the right patients, at the end of one year, 80% of people have improved at least one class. So these patients are treatable and you can make a difference in their life for sure. So to end, when you look at chest pain, there's a wide spectrum. You've got coronary microvascular dysfunction, you've got vasospastic angina, and you have atherosclerotic disease. And they're not separate patients. They go together. So I'll tell you a case that was, I'll give you an example. This is actually a 39 year old, and none of this is exaggerated, who had 57 casts. And she came to us from Indiana to our CTO operator, and she'd had a bypass. She had an LED, she had restenosis. They shouldn't have put the first stint in. Then she got restenosis, then she had a lima. Then she closed her lima graft. Then they had a second bypass. Then she closed a second bypass. So they, she came to us to do an LED CTO. And Jared says to me, he did the case. And then she kept having engine. He says, Tim, like, you need to look at this lady. So we hold drugs for two days. She came to the lab, calf lab and I'll show you this angiogram. So being off drugs for two days, she had thread-like severe vasospasm in all three corners. So the reason why she closed her lima, the reason why she closed her stint is because she had no outflow, because she had such severe spasm. We ever have a combination of drugs. She's not pain-free, but she has, she's class two, and she has not been to the emergency room and not been admitted now for six months. So this is what these people are out there. I can't tell you the number of people with spasm that have been stinted because people don't use nitroglycerin. So think about this broadly. Why does your patient have chest pain? It's not just put in a stint. It's more think about the whole picture. And it involves a team. So we use cardiac rehab. Um, we um, use um, the surgeons are involved. Is, is there a chance for revascularization? The, C, the CTO operators are involved. And we have a whole, and the women's heart program is involved. So 
pain management, all of this stuff and goes in together to do a comprehensive thing. So this is our team. And I will tell you, didn't exist four years ago. And now is the busiest one in the United States. You can do it. Trust me. You do this in Houston, you're going to be overwhelmed busy. So with that, we still need better options. There's a lot of people with chest pain. And we can make them feel better. And in general, they're ignored. So appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, certainly, it's been a fun journey. And I have uh, lots of strong memories here. And, you know, to be have the honor of doing the Dr. Lewis lecture is, is really a big one for me. And, you know, he is in the generation. I didn't meet him. and um, But he was in the generation of those people who were at the first Grunzi course. And it's an amazing thing. It's happened during our lifetime. And so, um, and certainly no place in the country has more history than Texas Heart Institute. So I'm delighted to be here. Really appreciate the opportunity to be in. Uh, although I don't think I can fully understand the Baylor, Texas Heart and all the hospitals around here and how they all work together. I think it's impossible for someone that's not from Houston. Anyway, thank you very much. Happy to answer questions.